So over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the Exponential series. And as we've been doing that, Paul continually walks up on stage and interrupts me. <laughs> and it was fun too, but you wanted me to. I did indeed. We talked about what it's been like being friends over the last 15 years and the impact that Paul's had on me and how much I've changed in the process. And um, the reality is though, it hasn't always been this easy. And we realize, and you can see, that there's a lot of people on our team that make a huge difference, but the relationship between Will and I is critical and how Satan would love to get in and destroy that. And we've had some really difficult times of conflict, and there were lots of reasons for that. I mean, he came into our lives about 15 years ago, and he was like the son I never had, and he'd mow my grass and do all kinds of things in our, in our home like, like a son, and then, and then he grew to a point where we got to be part of his marriage and he came on staff as a pastor and we could work together and mm -hmm. teach together and all of these things were just wonderful additions but it didn't hide the fact that we have a lot of differences. About a year and a half ago it was evident that it was very very difficult for both of us. The conflict is always hard but it's really hard when it gets personal. Conflict is hard, isn't it? How many of you ever had a personal conflict? <laughs> oh, you're human. <laughs> and you don't live in a cave somewhere. We're talking about a very important story in the book of Acts. It's a very brief story, but I want to draw some attention not only to just what we can learn about conflict, but I want you to be thinking about the conflicts in your life. Maybe you've got a specific one going on right now, or maybe there's kind of a pattern of conflicts, and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you as we talk in a general principle. And I would also ask you to keep your elbow holstered, <laughs> just in case you're sitting near somebody that maybe you've had a conflict with, and you want to say, Pastor Paul, that was a great point. I hope <laughs> they got it. So try to get what you need to get and let God get them. We're, we're in a review here in the book of Acts. We have been going through the stories of what's often called the first missionary journey. And Paul and Barnabas started over here in the Antioch where they were first called Christians. And they set out to first go to Cyprus, Barnabas' home island. And then they went through some of the cities of Asia Minor. Then they went back home. And the Jerusalem Council and all those things came in between. And now it was time to go back and visit them. Can you imagine bringing the great news about Jesus and how he brings eternal life and having some people become followers of Jesus and then making them a church, staying there a couple of weeks and leaving? I mean, they thought, you know, maybe we better go check on them. And so that's where our text starts this week. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 15. And I'm going to read just a couple of verses from the end of chapter 15, which starts with verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they were doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take them because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Whoa, that's a lot to put in one sentence, isn't it? So Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So let's do a little backstory. If you haven't been with us, or even if you have, let's talk about what the relationship with Paul and Barnabas has been like. Paul started as a radical anti-Christian activist. He was involved in stoning Christians and spearheading the persecution, throwing people in jail. He was adamantly against Jesus until on the road to Damascus, God knocked him down with a huge light and he had a come to Jesus moment where he really met who Jesus was and his life was totally changed. And if you look at the chronology of Paul's life, he went away actually for a couple of years and then he comes back, and he's trying to join the Christians in Jerusalem. And they're like, oh, no, we know who you are. 
this is probably your latest plot to infiltrate from the inside. And so they wanted nothing to do with him. And that's kind of how their friendship started, because Barnabas is not his real name. Do you remember what Barnabas' name is? Really? My mom knew last service. <laughs> his name was Joseph. Plain Joe, that's, but you never see that again. He's called Joseph, and then they nicknamed him Barnabas. Bar always means son of, and they called him the son of encouragement. And Barnabas, everywhere he goes, he has this desire to help people and develop them and help them grow. And, and so he steps in, and he gets to know Paul, and he hears his story, and Barnabas vouches for him. He says, Paul is the real deal, and he sponsors him into the church family. And then a little later, Barnabas again goes looking for Paul, and he brings him to Antioch, and they serve there together. And then God taps him on the shoulder and says, I want you to go out and begin this first missionary journey. So what we're talking is 11 years of solid friendship, a lot of which Barnabas has sponsored and been the caregiver for, and they have been welded together through the fires of travel and adversity and persecution. They are strong and solid followers of Jesus. They are strongly committed to the mission of Jesus. And they have had a connection with each other for 11 years. Nothing should separate them, right? And what happens? They have this conflict that some of us don't even fully understand what the history of it is. And it causes them to part company. What is that conflict? Well, it's over this guy named John Mark. Well, it might help you to realize that John Mark is Barnabas' cousin. So this is family. It's always about family somehow, isn't it? And, and so Barnabas says, let's take the kid with us. When we go on this missionary journey, he'll be a help to us. He will stick with us. And, you know, he's not going to be one of the main speakers, but he'll come along as a helper. In fact, that's how his job is described. It says back in chapter 13, so they're going along between these cities, and it says, and John was with them as their helper. That's the whole story right there. And remember, the book of Acts is written by Luke, who is a great friend of Paul's. He ends up being a travel companion, and he's trying to write about this, I think, very uh, not taking any sides, so very carefully. And eight verses later, it says they travel from Pamphus to Perga to Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. So he didn't even last eight verses. And, and I don't know what the problem was. There's a couple of guesses on my part. I mean, maybe John Mark is just homesick. He's not used to traveling so far away from home. Um, I've also noticed that wherever Paul goes, there's lots of angry people and occasional projectiles coming at them. And he may have decided this wasn't his cup of tea, that he could... Uh, have more fun elsewhere. And I also just wonder if maybe Paul and John Mark kind of clashed. If maybe there was a personality difference. And I only say that because if you look at Barnabas, he's this warm, I mean, you could sit down and have a cup of coffee with him, tell him your heart, and he would be there to be an encourager. That's his name, right? And Paul is kind of more of a director. I think you ought to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then this is what we're going to do, and I don't kind of feel like Paul would be just kind of chill, right? He's just kind of driven. And I don't know if something happened between them, but John Mark left him. And so that deeply scarred Paul's opinion of them, of him. So what happens then is they get ready for this second journey, and Barnabas says, let's take John Mark with us again. He's, he's a great guy, and I'm sure he'll do better this time. And, you know, people need time to develop. He's a little older now, a little more mature. I, I don't know what he said, but he wanted to take John Mark. And Paul's like, nope, he's a quitter. <laughs> Maybe he said he's a loser. But he, he said he deserted us. You see, he didn't just say he left. He said, no, he deserted us. He left us when we needed him. He is not somebody you can count on. He is not somebody I want with me. Now, in the scale of all things, who you take with you on a journey doesn't seem like it would be 
a huge deal. But this conflict came between two people who were mature believers, who were on mission, and it divided them. They parted company, it says. And I want to kind of walk through some things that we can learn uh, from this story and that we can learn from the process of conflict and restoration. And the first one is pretty obvious. Conflict is common. Conflict is inevitable in our lives, is it not? I think you can avoid some conflict by using wisdom and by learning. You can prevent having conflict all the time. Will you ever prevent all conflict? Not unless you want to, as I said, go move in a cave and live by yourself. And then you got to deal with yourself. So that's another issue. But conflict is always here because we are different people. Because as we talked about, Will and I have personality differences and age differences. And there's a lot of things that are different. And listen carefully. The very same things that can cause conflict, the differences, also are what make great teamwork. Paul and Barnabas weren't the same, and because of that, they were able to be great team members. They worked together well. But it also means that when that extra thing comes, the conflict about John Mark, that proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, it's the one more rock on the wagon that then knocks it off the road. And in your life, you will have conflicts where you work, you will have conflicts if you're married, you will have conflicts if you have children. You will have conflicts, perhaps, with neighbors. You will have conflicts within the church family. And the question really is, not how do I avoid conflicts, but how do I do them well? In fact, even higher than that, how do I honor the Lord in the way that I deal with conflicts in my life? The other reason I think conflict is so common is because there is an enemy that would love to destroy us. Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's his plan for your life. And one of the most powerful things that God can use is believers who are united together on mission with him and unity in a church family, unity in a family, unity in a life group is a precious and wonderful gift that has to be preserved at all costs. And Satan loves to get in there and begin to divide between husband and wife and between individuals in a church family and between individuals in a community. And Paul later says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Because, you know, our first assumption when we're in a conflict with somebody is, it's their fault. The problem here is them. And he says, oh, no, the conflict isn't between flesh and blood. It's between spiritual forces, powers. It's, it's the picture of what Satan would love to destroy and what God would love to build. And so I tell you, the closer you walk to the Lord and the more you want to serve him, the more you will have to do well in the conflicts that come. And as you think through that, I want you to honestly assess, how do I do when somebody is different than I am, when somebody disagrees with me, when somebody maybe does something that offends me or I don't like or it causes me pain? How do I respond in that situation and I believe that it's a direct measurement of your spiritual maturity, of how well you love God and love others, especially in the middle of conflict. So the second thing I want you to think about, and we see in this issue of Paul and Barnabas, is we need to clarify the circles of our conflict. So you have some circles there on your outline, and I'm going to draw some up here and try to help you ask the question, which whenever you get into some kind of a conflict, I want you to ask the question, how big a deal is this? What's, what's the conflict really about? What's going on here? Because I think you'll find that way too often, we are way too emo emotionally invested or conflicted with somebody else about something that isn't as important as we think it is at that moment. So the inside circle... I want you to write the word core, C-O-R-E. These are core issues. These are things that we believe that have to do with 
with who God is and what the scripture means to us and what is capital T truth and, and things like justice and protecting children and the, the things that we feel like these I am passionately committed to. Are those worth fighting about or fighting for? Yeah. Those are worth speaking up about and, and addressing. And when Paul is dealing with the new church, he's, he walks around and he says, this is the truth and these are false teachers. And they're saying that the resurrection has already come. And if you look at almost every letter Paul writes, he's saying, don't believe this and do believe this. These are big issues. So a lot of times our conflicts can be about things that are very important, very major. The next, site, the next circle, and it's often built on our core, is values. That is how important is this to me? And I would write in there, in those two, write the words believe. What is it that I believe? And those usually come into this conflict. And I think if we could dig down in Paul and Barnabas' heart, you would see that they had two values that they both agreed on. Paul said if somebody's going to be a follower of Jesus and they're going to go on mission with him and they're going to be out representing him, they need to be tough, they need to be above, care, above uh, reproach in their character, they need to be people who will last and stick. We need excellence. Is that an important value? Yeah. And Barnabas had a value that says people don't get there overnight. There needs to be time and development and it takes gentle walking with people through the process before they can get there. Is that also an important value? Yeah. Quite often we have conflicts because we're holding things that are important, but we hold them at a higher level than the person we're talking to. And out of that comes the next level where a lot of our conflicts come out at, and that is opinions. Everybody has them. Opinions, this is what I think should happen. Usually there's some basis for values in what I think should happen, but this is my opinion. And Paul's opinion was John Mark shouldn't come with him, and Barnabas' opinion was John Mark should get another chance. So that's where the conflict actually came out. But it was based on some values. Now, these are guys who have the same core. They believe the same things at a deep level. They agreed on so much. But the focus of their attention came to be on what was immediately their problem, their difficulty. And the last circle out here is preferences. What I prefer. And under that, why don't you write the word feel? This is what I feel more comfortable about. This is what feels right to me. You hurt my feelings. It may have nothing to do with core and important issues. It's just that I prefer this and you prefer that. So if we look at what Paul and Barnabas, is, their, their conflict was probably in this area. If you think about the conflicts you have, you'll probably be able to go, okay, I think the conflict is really in this area. But here's the point I want you to really wrestle with. Most of us make way too big a deal about things that really are not that important. We're having major conflicts and in the moment, we get so emotional and so invested, all we see is right now and what I want. We had a funny one that I tell with Jan and I. We, several years ago, we were, for some reason, we were trying to just get something that was wet to dry out. So we were sticking it in the washer to wring it out. And, and so I, I set the dial where it was supposed to go. <laughs> and my wife came along and she set the dial where it was supposed to go. And we have this silly conflict in the laundry room, and we turn to each other at the same moment, and we say, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Was that a core issue? No. Isn't it funny how we often get really exercised over things that really don't matter? 
there was a couple that was really working through some conflict one time, and, and they were doing a great job. And I said, what are some of the things that you found help you? And they said, this is so important. After we talk about here's what you think and want, and here's what I think and want, and after we've understood each other and communicated, we ask another question. We say, on a scale of 1 to 10, how big a deal is this to you? Isn't that a great question? Not, can you defend your case? Not, do you want to win? Not, are your feelings aroused about this? But step back and ask yourself, on a scale of 1 to 10, give it a number. And the guy says, a lot of times I've been arguing eloquently for this, and I have to say, you know, on the scale of all things, this is a 4. And as I said, well, for me, this is an 8. And it doesn't really matter how you argue about it or how you feel about it. It really is about loving and saying, you know what? That's a lot more important to you than it is to me. Why don't we do that your way? Wouldn't that resolve a lot of conflicts? If you just slowed down and said, is this about a core issue of truth? No. Is this about our values? Well, maybe it comes out of our values. Mostly it's about our opinions, and a lot of it comes out of our preferences. And let me tell you one of the sad things. People bust up marriages, they leave churches, they break up their life groups for things that really don't matter. And I will tell you, when you get two godly people who love each other and love the Lord and are willing to sit down and work it, you can solve most conflicts. I won't say every conflict, but I've seen people who have gone through horrendously tearing, difficult differences and they have worked it out and come to a place of unity and connectedness and oneness. And believe me, God is honored when we do that. I will say also that one of the painful things in my life, having been here some 30 years, is everywhere I go, I see people that used to go to family church. I told Will that a lot of years ago, and he said, you know what, I'm seeing that now too. And you know, some people leave for significant reasons. They believe something different than we do, Sometimes I think it's been a leadership failure on my part where they haven't been shepherded like they needed to be. There's legitimate things. And when they go somewhere else and they get involved in a church and they continue growing, I can deal with that, right? Because God has my permission to move his sheep around wherever he wants to. <laughs> he was really relieved when I gave him that position. <laughs> but you know what really happens a lot of times? People get their feelings hurt by somebody in the congregation and they don't want to talk about it and they don't want to deal with it and they just drop out. And you know how many people drop out for silly things and they don't continue growing and they don't continue getting involved in a church body and that hurts. And I think that's one of the questions to ask ourselves is what is my level of conflict and what is my response to it? And I think you'll find that most of us respond way too strongly to things that are not very important. It's not a core issue. It's not a big deal. And if you can back yourself down and say, you know what, this is not a big deal, it will help you get to the place where you can resolve that. So second thing, what is our level of conflict or what is the circle of conflict? What, how big a deal is it? I'm okay. Pa Paul goes on to say a little later, he says, do not have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. <laughs> Is that a hard Bible verse? <clears throat> yeah, he's saying a lot of the things you get all excited about really are just foolish arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. That momentary flash tends to break relationships. And then he says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. If I were to ask your closest associates, people you go to school with, people you live with, if I were to say to them, do they have a hot temper? Are they easily offended? Do they get critical very easily? What would they say? Yeah, sometimes our mirror of the people around us is a little just uncomfortable. It says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but listen, kind to everyone. Kind to who? Everyone. People that are like you and people that are not like you. And people that like you and people that don't like you. 
And then he says, able to teach, which means you have to learn to teach, and then not resentful. You see, so often when people have conflicts, they barely work them through like, yeah, sorry, yeah, I shouldn't have said that, me either. But they don't really talk it out. They don't really forgive each other. They don't really let go of it. And they end up with this bathtub ring of residue of resentment towards their relationships. And maybe you aren't really ugly to people. You just distance yourself from them. And by the way, all of us conflict avoiders, you never really avoid conflict because eventually it will affect you and it affects all your relationships. So he says, this is the plan. If you're a follower of Jesus, you, you shouldn't be quarrelsome. You shouldn't be easily offended. And then he goes on and he says, opponents must be gently instructed. We think a swift right to the jaw, that's what they need. Or, or maybe if you're in the shower and you're thinking of all the things you'd love to say to them if you had a chance, just maybe you're a little resentful. Then he goes on and he says, in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. He's not talking about little stuff here. He's talking about people who are trapped and are captive to do Satan's will, about the fact that they've lost their senses. And he says, even in those big issues, what are the ways that we respond? Gently instruct. The last few people you've tried to straighten out, would they describe that as gently instructed? You see, I think it's really hilarious that Paul is telling Timothy this. If you know anything about Paul's personality, he's big and bold, and Timothy is the timid one. So he's saying, Paul's saying, don't ream them out, gently instruct them. And Timothy's thinking, okay, Paul, you too. <laughs> I think Paul's telling him what he's learned in this process. Third thing I want you to see in this particular conflict is that what God had called them to continues. Paul was called to go and serve those churches Barnabas was called to go and serve those churches. They had a conflict. What did they do? They both went. Why? Because that's what God had called them to. And I hope that those conflicts that are in your life don't derail you from what God has called you to. I hope that you're here at Family Church because God has called you here to be an active part, to support the vision that God's given us. And I hope you don't go anywhere else until God calls you somewhere else. You see, it isn't about comfort. It isn't about preference. It's about calling. And when God calls you to something, it's a serious matter. And you're not doing it for people. That's where we keep getting our, our eyes off of God. We, we do or don't do things because of people. Instead of saying, God, what have you called me to? And no matter what comes, I'm going to do what you've called me to. And in fact, God was able to use even that situation and the, the cause and effect that comes out of this. And you guys need to understand, when you have a conflict, when you break a relationship, when you no longer work with somebody, the consequences can last for the rest of your life. And some of you have a trail of broken relationships behind you all the rest of your life. And it costs. And what was the, the cause and effect here? Well, in the short term, both Paul and Barnabas held to what God called them. So Barnabas grabs Mark, and they go serve the Lord, and Paul grabs a young man named Silas. In fact, I wonder if it was because of this conflict and seeing Barnabas' example that you see the rest of Paul's life. He picks up Timothy, and then Titus, and Onesimus, and Epaphroditus, and he's continually picking up some of these young guys and pouring into them and mentoring them. I think Paul became more of a Barnabas, maybe because of this conflict, and what happens in John Mark's life? Well, Paul never says, sorry, Barnabas, I was wrong, you were right. But he says at the end of his life, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Yeah, Barnabas, you poured into his life and it made a difference. You didn't give up on him when I was ready to give up on him. And you know what happened to John Mark? He associated with Barnabas for a period of time. He then began to work closely with the Apostle Peter. And then he wrote a book about all that Jesus had taught and done. And you know what it was called? Mark. 
And do you know that it was the first gospel that was written down about the life of Jesus? Do our conflicts matter and how we handle them and how we come out of them? Because Barnabas said, I need to stand up for John Mark. And because of that, the gospel of Jesus Christ went out in written form. And actually, we think Matthew and Luke both used Mark to help write their gospels. Was it a big deal? Yeah. Listen to me. Your conflicts are always a big deal. No matter how much you try to run from them or how often you start them, how you handle them, how you work through them matters to you and to everybody around you. To come back to the conflict that Will and I wrestled through, I want to talk a little bit more about it. Watch this. Well, our differences have always been there. Yeah. You know, I, I, we're different generations, mm-hmm. which is... Not, no kidding. That's obvious. I'm, I'm not much older, but a little <laughs> bit. I'm taller, definitely. Um, so there, there are also differences just in the way we, you know, he's more of a conflict confronter. I am more of an avoider. And sometimes a conflict starter. Sometimes a conflict starter. And, and he's more likely just to pop in the office, hey, I got a great idea, hear me, and just start off with that. I'm more like a little warm up and kind of talk about it and kind of have that kind of relational side of it. And I think there's just a lot of differences in, in personality and in the way that we even our teaching styles and stuff. Which for most of our relationship was no problem at all. Right. It was just a fun difference between us. But boy, when you add four or five other things to it, and then you push both of us to more of a, an extreme max position, it makes it a lot more difficult. Yeah. About 18 months ago, Paul and I uh, were in a, a real tension in our relationship. It was difficult. And it's funny because you would see each of us up on stage and you don't know it, but in the background, when we're sitting at coffee and when we're sitting in each other's offices, it wasn't easy. No. And there was, I think, a lot of factors in that. Um, you know, we'd started a new campus and now it had matured. And so they're doing different things in Green than we are in Sutherland. And Will's feeling is like we've got to be together, so we've got to convince Sutherland to do something that we're doing. Or or we can't. Or, or, yeah. or they can't. And so there's that tension that, that had to do with, I think, the two campuses. Yeah, and that stretching. And then there's other um, voices coming in because there's more people on staff, so there's more dialogue like in those areas, and it started to pull. And, and, I, and I think some of it was you're just growing and maturing as a leader, taking more of a active role in the leadership of the whole church, which is exciting, but it also was a change in our relationship. Well, and I, I picture myself like a junior high who is, doesn't know that his arm has grown an inch and he's knocking over the milk. And in some ways, there's some leadership aspects like that, where there's just some stumbling into. And I remember what you said about me um, coming to see you, that when you saw me coming, it was a little bit more of a... Uh, yeah. And I'm sure you felt like, how do I get through that door and still keep this relationship going? Mm-hmm. What okay. are some things you think helped us get through that? I mean, there were several things. but I'll tell you one of them, and this sounds totally um, funny, but the, that difference in personality, no matter how tenacious life is, Paul can always still laugh. <laughs> that's and, true. and that's the perfect scenario for the two of us because he would laugh. And he can always make a joke. No and I, and I could always make a joke. And it, oftentimes when I would say some, we'd say something to the fact, man, this is really hard. And then I'd say, I know it's your fault too. <laughs> and then he would do that and he would do his giggle and it would relieve some tension. I think that was part of it. And I want to say that Will continued to pursue closeness. And, and I know that being an avoider, it's possible for me just to, to kind of relax back and just be utilitarian, just functional and not press into personal. And you always would come in and say, how are you doing? And, and you would say, how are we doing? And you kept bringing that up and it wasn't always comfortable, but I always knew that meant you really wanted closeness, not just survival. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one time going to the door, we were in your office and it's like that realization of what a relationship really means. Cause I opened the door and I, are we going to walk out like that? So I shut the door and sat back down and I think I made fun of you. <laughs> but it, it was tough and it was real. And, and I think one of the things is, is we kept talking, and I think we both wanted to please the Lord. We wanted to do what was right. We wanted to see God prosper family church. We didn't want it to be about winning. Mm-hmm. And I think God used that to help us get through some tough things. And, and honestly, we learned a lot through that process. It is. And you know, one of the, the those behind the scene things that, that no one would know about, but we've made some alterations on how our team sets up, and it allows for freedom at both campuses. 
that allows us to, to try things out and there not be pressure upon the other. So we've made some wise decisions coming out of it. We didn't let the conflict um, derail us from following what Christ had. Because I know for both of us at some points it would have just been easier to walk away, but neither of us were willing to. And I think that's a, a powerful testament that conflict can be personal, but it doesn't have to end it. And that Satan would love to use it for destruction. But God wants to use it to clarify and to strengthen. And, and I think our relationship is closer than ever. I agree. God wants to use it for good. It's not just lessons out there in the Bible, is it? It's real stuff in our life. As you think about the conflicts that you're in right now, the things that are going on, things you're struggling with, maybe... Maybe you need to take this message and say, where do I need to lean in? For some of you who are avoiders, you need to say, I need to have that conversation. I need to bring up the topic. I need to be willing to risk the conflict to heal the relationship. For some of you, you need to lean in to really forgiving. Oh yeah, you've talked it through, but you still hang on to that resentment. For some of you, you just need to realize that <clears throat> you've got to get over something that you've made a big deal out of when it's not that big a deal. And the scripture says we are to bear with each other. I did a wedding yesterday and I told them that our vows should probably be, you're committing yourself to love, honor, and annoy this person for the rest of your life. Because <laughs> living with another person has stuff to it, doesn't it? Yeah. The second question I want you to wrestle with, and it's similar, is what do you need to learn from this? What do you need to learn from our discussion today about conflict? What do you need to learn about yourself? <laughs> Have you noticed that the common factor in all your conflicts is you? Maybe there's a pattern there. Maybe there's a way in which you tend to be which creates more conflict than necessary. As we start talking about whether you're a confronter or an avoider, you start going, yeah, that's me. You start realizing that, that God's plan is for us to be kind to everyone, to be able to teach, which means you processed it and learned some things so you can help somebody else, and it means that you're not to be resentful. And so there's some things that we can learn about ourselves, and, and as Will said, we changed some things about the way the organization was operating because there were some things that were creating undue conflict in the systems. And then you ask God to give you the love that he can give us because human love is pretty shallow, pretty superficial. And when God gives us that love, then we can love each other through those conflicts. And I assure you, in most cases, they can be worked out if you'll let God do that. Father, thank you for these very real and very vital lessons. Thank you for Paul and Barnabas and, and the honesty of Luke to include this into Scripture and to say these two guys that were both a big deal in the early church, they had a problem, and they didn't handle it well to begin with, but they came back later, and they honored and respected each other, and, and they kept on mission. And Father, I, I ask as we look at this topic that right now you would help us to lean in where we need to in the conflicts that are in our lives whether it's parents and children, husbands and wives, coworkers, fellow students, or maybe it's people in the same church together, and that you would help us to struggle well to let you rise to the surface and change who we are from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.